All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're here today, uh, December the 13th, continuing the trial state of Tennessee versus Christian Bassett and Kevin Colbert and Richard Williams. Uh, the state had completed its uh, case in chief <coughs> yesterday, and so uh, <coughs> we sent you draft the instructions. We'll have another conversation on that a little bit later. I do want to uh, go ahead and uh, Talk about defense proof, uh, Mr. Jones. You do have your witness here today. I do, Your Honor. Have him seated outside of the courtroom. In general, I understand that you wish to have a, a, a hearing determining the competency of him as an expert witness. That correct? Yes. And I, I assume I could be wrong about this, but I, I'm going to bet he's an expert in rap music. He is, Your Honor. All right. So can you have him step in here? I will, Your Honor. May I step out to get him? Yeah. Hey, Your Honor. We are going to ask if uh, Investigator Tom Walker. You may remain. As I understand it, you hold a PhD, is that correct? Yes. And Dr. Uh, Nielsen, for the benefit of his honor and all counsel gathered here today, would you outline your educational qualifications beginning with your undergraduate education through your matriculation at the University College of London and then subsequently your PhD at the University of Sheffield? Uh, sure. I received my bachelor's degree in 1998 uh, from the University of Virginia. Uh, my concentrations uh, were in literature and sociology. I then went on to get my master's in English literature from the University of London, where I focused on English Renaissance literature, specifically Shakespeare. Um, and then I went to the University of Sheffield several years later um, and completed my PhD, also focusing on literature, um, Literature, culture, and music, uh, specifically uh, African American literature, culture, and music. And relative to your dissertation, uh, is that required as part of your matriculation and final award of your PhD? Yes. And what did you do your dissertation on? Uh, the uh, the title of it was called "Under Surveillance: The Evolution of Black Arts in the United States," and it was really uh, my research uh, focuses on the sort of intersections between law, law enforcement and African-American cultural expression. And in particular, what of interest uh, caught your uh, attention uh, such that you were able to write an authoritative dissertation on that particular issue? Could you rephrase that question? Yes, sir. What particularly were you interested in with regards to your dissertation in the intersection of First Amendment expression and the legal system? I've, I've been interested in particularly uh, black artistic expression in the United States starting in the antebellum South all the way up to present day and my research has really focused on the ways that um, law enforcement um, has uh, responded to that expression but also how that expression has responded to law enforcement and how it's been this sort of ongoing almost conversation if you will over the last two or three centuries. 
And relative to positions of academia and teaching experience, would you uh, explain to the judge uh, your academic background and your teaching experience? Well, I am an associate professor and currently I am the chair of the Department of Liberal Arts at the University of Richmond. Um, I have taught courses in African American literature. I have taught courses on hip hop culture. I have taught classes specifically on rap music. Um, I also teach introductory literature courses. Um, I teach sort of a wide range of things, but I tend to focus on uh, the things that sort of come out of my PhD work. And prior to your uh, tenure at the University of uh, Richmond, where was your teaching experience? Uh, before I had my PhD, I taught for several years at a community college in Northern Virginia. And relative to authoritative publications in the area of rap, hip hop, music, First Amendment expression, and law. What books have you authored? Uh, my first book was related to hip-hop culture and politics. That came out on Oxford University Press in 2015. I'm currently working on my second book um, called Rap on Trial, actually. Um, and that will be that's with New Press, and that should be out in a year or so if I can uh, get myself to write it fast enough. And relative to the hip hop and Obama reader, who did you uh, co uh, edit that uh, with, and what academic qualifications were you able to uh, glean relative to this other individual? Uh, he, uh, I, co I co wrote this and edited this with uh, Professor Travis Gosa at Cornell University. Uh, he is a professor in their Africana Studies Department. And who are you co authoring your? current project, Rap on Trial. Uh, professor Andrea Dennis at the University of Georgia. Uh, she's a law professor at the University of Georgia. And doctor, moving on to the area of peer-reviewed articles and your familiarity with this particular subject, if you can, uh, if you will, uh, chronologically, can you uh, go from your first article forward up until your most recent peer-reviewed and published article of authority in your particular specialty? Sure. Um, my peer-reviewed articles, specifically in academic journals, uh, go back to 2009. Um, I, I wrote in the Journal of Popular Music Studies uh, related to hip-hop and politics. Um, in 2010, I wrote for another peer-reviewed journal called Popular Communication. And that was looking at uh, various technologies in the production of hip hop and rap music. Um, I wrote for the journal Flax Studies uh, on specifically uh, ideas of policing and rap music. Um, but I've also written on other topics. Uh, as I said, this sort of research spans uh, a number of years, even centuries. So in 2011, I wrote an article um, uh, related to the slave spirituals. Um, and then in 2012, uh, um, I submitted work, I, I published works um, in a number of areas. Uh, in one journal was related to Langston Hughes' poetry, uh, another one was related specifically to rap, you know, rap lyrics, and then another was sort of pulling in on this special uh, law enforcement and rap music. All of those were in 2012, all of them peer reviewed. Um, I've written an article in a uh, social science journal called Race and Justice in 2014 called Rap on Trial. I co-wrote that with a criminologist at UC Irvine. Um, and I wrote uh, an article on um, black arts poetry, the poetry of the sort of late 60s, early 70s. Um, and I wrote that for African American Review. So just with respect to academic publications and peer-reviewed journals, that's my background. In relative to recent features and op-eds, is it fair to say, and I'm not going to belabor the point, that you've outlined those uh, at length in your uh, CV, which outlines your qualifications as an expert in this particular field, is that right? That's correct. I routinely write um, op-eds and feature pieces for publications like the New York Times, the Washington Post, Rolling Stone. That's pretty. That's a pretty regular thing. And in fact, you were just recently recognized in Rolling Stone in the article Rap on Trial, May 2017, why rap lyrics should be off limits. Is that correct? Correct. I wrote that article. 
All right. And in fact, you've also been recognized in the Atlantic and you have been recognized in various NPR journals and the Los Angeles Times. Is that correct? I, yes, I, not only do I write routinely for these publications, but I'm interviewed regularly by outlets ranging from the Washington Post and the New York Times to PBS News Hour. Um, it's a regular, just part of what I do. And beyond the peer reviewed articles, you've written uh, articles for such mainstream uh, communication sources and newspapers as the uh, USA Today, is that correct? Yeah. And relative. Uh, uh, to your experience with the legal uh, system, uh, share with uh, his honor your uh, uh, submissions to the United States Supreme Court, particularly on the issue of rap music and hip hop culture, concerning two particular cases that have ended been before our nation's highest court. Uh, I was the lead author of two amicus briefs uh, submitted to the United States Supreme Court. Both of those briefs were related to uh, the conventions of rap music in both of those cases that was relevant. Uh, the most recent one I wrote alongside um, a, a number of people, including some hip hop artists, um, some of the authors or co-signees uh, included um, an artist who goes by the name Killer Mike, um, another named Big Boy from the group Outcast, another named T.I., uh, both of them Atlanta rappers, all three of them Atlanta rappers, and then a whole slew of um, scholars from across the country signed on to that brief. Would it be fair to say that not only from a scholarly standpoint, but a necessity standpoint, uh, given your position at the University of Richmond, that you have to keep yourself abreast and up to date with regards to the changes in rap music and hip hop culture. I do my best. Um, yes, absolutely. That is, that I, would, I would say that that is a requirement. It is not an easy thing to do. It is a rapidly changing genre, probably like all musical genres. But yes, that is. Uh, I do my very best. And have you been called upon to speak at various conferences and as the invited keynote speaker in areas ranging all the way from Cambridge, England? Uh, to uh, here locally in the United States? Yes, I routinely speak at uh, lectures both in the United States um, and overseas. And if you spoke at such prestigious uh, institutions as the New York University School of Law, particularly relative to the subject of drawing the line, Alanis rap lyrics, and of course that would reference a case that was heard or considered by our United States Supreme Court? That one was heard, and yes, I, I, uh, I did, did give a, a talk at NYU Law School. And uh, is the selected conference and invited talks section of your CV uh, accurate with regards to where you've been called upon to speak as an expert on rap music and its intersection with the legal community? It is, it is accurate, though it is not exhaustive. Uh, I've said all of these are accurate. I've also given several others that I, these are sort of the greatest hits. And also relative to uh, interviews, you've listed a number of actual published interviews as far as in magazines and things of that nature. You've also been uh, recognized on uh, national TV as an expert in this particular area. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, relative to your legal experience, have you prior to today been certified and allowed to test Testify as a rap expert in the courts of Santa Barbara, California. Yes. In the courts of Ventura, California. Yes. In the courts of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Yes. And also in most close to us, Fulton County, which I believe the court would recognize is Atlanta, Georgia. Is that right? That's correct. And uh, relative to your professional uh, memberships, uh, well, 
going back to your legal experience, you've listed uh, also some additional legal experience contained therein relative to your being certified and recognized as an expert by these courts. Is that correct? That's correct, including uh, the United States District Court for the Northern District of uh, Indiana is also uh, sort of, uh, permitted to testify as an expert there as well. And, and do you likewise uh, also uh, list your professional memberships with regards to uh, what would be considered peer-reviewed and appropriate uh, memberships for an individual of your capacity and caliber to maintain? Yes. And have you received various awards uh, from these academic uh, institutions uh, for uh, your uh, work and your particular knowledge in this, if you will, niche area with regards to the intersection of law and rap music? The awards that I have received, one was from my university and one was from the state of Virginia. And in this capacity that we've asked you here today, have you reviewed videos and other music information relative to the group LIE Gang? Yes. And are you familiar with what is commonly referred to as gangster rap or gangsta? Rap. Okay, so rap. Yes, I am. Uh, okay. My, my, my tongue's difficult for me to pronounce it. And, and are you prepared to testify if the court allows you to be certified as an of a firearm during a dangerous felony, which have been defined for you above regarding each alleged victim. Alright, so those are the charged offenses as well as any other less included offense you may properly consider in this case. This next instruction is concerning the order of consideration. In reaching your verdict, you shall first consider the offense charged in the presentment. If you unanimously find a defendant guilty of that offense beyond a reasonable doubt, you shall return a verdict of guilty for that offense. If you unanimously find a defendant not guilty of that offense or have a reasonable doubt of the defendant's guilt of that offense, you shall then proceed to consider whether or not the defendant is guilty of the next lesser included offense in order from greatest to least within that count of the presentment. You shall not proceed to consider any lesser included offense until you have first made a unanimous determination that the defendant is not guilty of the immediately preceding greater offense or unanimously have a reasonable doubt of the defendant's guilt of that offense. If you have a reasonable doubt of the guilt of the defendant as to all offenses charged and included in that count of the presentment, you shall return a verdict of not guilty and proceed to the other counts of the presentment. Fines. If you find if you find the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of any offense, you may, in your discretion, fix a fine in any amount according to the chart below. Such fine will be in addition to any other punishment provided by law. No fine is required. You will report any such fine with your verdict. So you can just look at this uh, chart. It shows you all the possible offenses uh, that you could possibly reach a verdict on in this case. And you just look at in that chart, find out where that level of offense is, and set a fine according to the chart. Um, so second degree murder, attempt first degree murder, facilitation of first degree murder. <coughs> Finally guilty of that, you can assess a fine anywhere from zero dollars up to a maximum $50,000 and that is per count. And uh, there is no fine for first degree murder in count three. All right, criminal, respons criminal responsibility for the conduct of another. The defendants are criminally responsible as a party to the offenses of first degree murder, attempted first degree murder, and employing a firearm during a dangerous felony if the offenses were committed by the defendant's own conduct, by the conduct of another for which the defendant or defendants are criminally responsible, or by both. 
each party to the offense may be charged with the commission of the offense. The defendants are criminally responsible for an offense committed by the conduct of another if, acting with the intent to promote or assist the commission of the offense, or to benefit in the proceeds or results of the offense, the defendant or defendants solicit, direct, aid, or attempt to aid another person to commit the offense. A defendant who is criminally responsible for an offense may be found guilty not only for that offense, but also for any other offense or offenses committed by another if you find beyond a reasonable doubt that the other offense or offenses committed were natural and probable consequences of the original offense for which the defendant is found criminally responsible, and that the elements of the offense, uh, of, excuse me, of the other offense or offenses that accompany the original offense have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. In deciding the criminal responsibility of the defendant, the jury may also take into consideration any evidence offered that the defendant attempted to thwart or withdraw from any of the offenses that followed from the original offense. To find a defendant criminally responsible for the acts of another, it is not necessary that you find the defendant was present or the defendant took a physical part in the, in the crime. Encouragement of the principal offender is sufficient. However, mere presence, of the, uh, presence during the commission of the offense is not sufficient to support a conviction. Before you find a defendant guilty of being criminally responsible for said offenses committed by the conduct of another, you must find that all the essential elements of said offenses have been proven by the state beyond a reasonable doubt. It is not a defense that the person for whose conduct the, the defendant is criminally responsible has not been prosecuted. Identity. One of the issues in this case is the identification of the defendants as the person or persons who committed the crimes. The state has a burden of proving identity beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, proof of identity may include identification testimony. Identification testimony is an expression of belief or impression by the witness, and its value may depend upon your consideration of several factors. Some of the factors which you may consider are the witness's capacity and opportunity to observe the offender. This includes, among other things, the length of time available for observation, the distance from which the witness observed, the lighting, and whether the person who committed the crime was a prior acquaintance of the witness. The degree of certainty expressed by the witness regarding the identification and the circumstances under which it was made, including whether it's a product of the witness's own recollection. The occasions, if any, on which the witness failed to make an identification of the defendant or made an identification that was inconsistent with the identification at trial. The occasions, if any, on which the witness made an identification that was consistent with the identification at trial, and the circumstances surrounding such identifications, and five, any other factors fairly raised by the evidence. Again, the state has a burden of proving every element of the crime charged, and this burden specifically includes the identity of the defendant or defendants as the person or persons who commit the crime for which they are on trial. If, after considering all of the evidence, including any identification testimony, you have a reasonable doubt that the defendant is the person who committed the crime, you must find that defendant not guilty. <coughs> against interest. Evidence has been introduced in this trial of a statement or statements by a defendant made outside the trial to show an admission against interest. An admission against interest is a statement by a defendant which acknowledges the existence or truth of some fact necessary to be proven to establish the guilt of that defendant or which tends to show guilt of that defendant or is evidence of some material fact, but not amounting to a confession. While this evidence has been received, it remains your duty to decide if, in fact, such a statement was ever made. If you believe a statement was not made by a defendant, you should not consider it. If you decide the statement was made by a defendant, you must judge the truth of the fact stated. In so determining, consider the circumstances under which the statement was made. Also, consider whether any of the other evidence before you tends to contradict the statement in whole or in part. You must not, however, arbitrarily disregard any part of any statement, but rather should consider all of any statement you believe was made and is true. You are the sole judge of what weight should be given in such statement. If you decide a statement was made, you should consider it with all the other evidence in the case and determine the defendant's guilt or innocence. Flight. The flight of a person accused of a crime is a circumstance which, when considered with all the facts of the case, may justify an inference of guilt. Flight is a voluntary withdrawal of oneself for the purpose of evading arrest or prosecution for the crime charged. Where the evidence presented proves beyond a reasonable doubt that a defendant fled is a question for your determination. The law makes no precise distinction as to the manner or method of flight, 
It may be open, or it may be a hurried or concealed departure, or it may be a concealment within the jurisdiction. However, it takes both the leaving the scene of the difficulty and a subsequent hiding out, evasion, or concealment in the community, or leaving the community for parts unknown, <coughs> to constitute flight. If flight is proved, the fact of flight alone does not allow you to find the defendant is guilty of the crime alleged. However, since flight by a defendant may be caused by a consciousness of guilt, you may consider the fact of flight, if flight is so proven, together with all of the other evidence when you decide the guilt or innocence of the defendant. On the other hand, an entirely innocent person may take flight, and such flight may be explained by proof offered or by the facts and circumstances of the case. Whether there was flight by a defendant, the reasons for it, and the weight to be given to it are questions for you to determine. Evidence of other crimes. If from the proof you find that a defendant or defendants has or have committed a crime other than those for which they are on trial, you may not consider such evidence to prove their disposition to commit such a crime as those on trial. This evidence may only be considered by you for the limited purpose of determining whether it provides A, the complete story of the crime. That is, such evidence may be considered by you where the prior crime and the present alleged crime are logically related or connected, or are part of the same transaction so that proof of the other tends or is necessary to prove the one charged, or is necessary for a complete account thereof. The defendant's identity. That is, such evidence may be considered by you if it tends to establish the defendant's identity in the case on trial. C. Motive. That is, such evidence may be considered by you if it tends to show a motive of the defendant for the commission of the offense presently charged. Or D. The defense intent. That is, such evidence may be considered by you if it tends to establish that the defendant actually intended to commit the crime with which he is presently charged. Such evidence of, other crime, of another crime, if considered by you for any purpose, must not be considered for any purpose other than that specifically stated. Definitions. Employ means to make use of. Handgun means any firearm with a barrel length of less than 12 inches that is designed, made, or adapted to be fired with one hand. Firearm means anything, excuse me, any weapon designed, made, or adapted to expel a projectile by the action of an explosive or any device readily convertible to that use. Intentionally, unless otherwise defined, means that a person acts intentionally with respect to the nature of the conduct or to results of the conduct when it is the person's conscious objective or desire to engage in the conduct or cause the result. Knowingly, unless otherwise defined, means that a person acts knowingly with respect to the conduct or to circumstances surrounding the conduct when the person is aware of the nature of the conduct or that the circumstances exist. A person acts knowingly with respect to results of the person's conduct when the person is aware that the conduct is reasonably certain to cause a result. The requirement of knowingly is also established to show the defendant's uh, acted intentionally, which is defined pretty above. Recklessly, unless under, otherwise defined, means that a person acts recklessly with respect to circumstances surrounding the conduct when the person is aware of but consciously disregards the substantial and unjustifiable risk that the circumstances exist or the result will occur. The risk must be of such a nature and degree that its disregard constitutes a gross deviation from the standard of care that an ordinary person would exercise under all the circumstances as viewed from the accused person's standpoint. At times during the trial, I have ruled upon the admissibility, the admissibility of evidence. You must not concern yourself with these rulings. Neither by these rulings, the instructions, nor by any other remark, do I mean to indicate any opinion as to the facts or as to what your verdict should be. The statements, arguments, and remarks of the attorneys are intended to help you in understanding and applying the law, but they are not evidence. You should disregard any statements made that you believe are not supported by the evidence. You are the exclusive judges of the facts in this case. Also, you are exclusive judges of the law under the direction of the court. In applying the law to the facts and deciding this case, you should consider all the evidence in light of your own observations and experience in life. The law presumes the defendants are innocent of the charges against them. This presumption remains with the defendants throughout every stage of the trial, and it is not overcome unless from all the evidence in the case you are convinced beyond a reasonable doubt the defendant or defendants is or are guilty. The state has a burden of proving the guilt of the defendants beyond a reasonable doubt, and this burden never shifts, but remains on the state throughout the trial of the case. The defendants not, are not required to prove their innocence. Reasonable doubt is that doubt created by investigation of all the proof in the case and an inability after such investigation to let the mind rest easily at uncertainty of guilt. 
A reasonable doubt is a doubt based upon reason and common sense after careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence in this case. Absolute certainty of guilt is not demanded by the law to convict of any criminal charge, but moral certainty is required, and this certainty is required as to every element of proof necessary to constitute the offense. A reasonable doubt is just that, a doubt that is reasonable after examination of all the facts of this case. The same must be a reasonable doubt all the elements of the crime charged that the crime, if in fact committed, was committed by the defendants in Knox County, Tennessee, and that it was committed before the finding and returning of the imprisonment in this case. Some of you have taken notes during the trial. Once you retire the jury room, you may refer to your notes, but only to refresh your own memory of the witness's testimony. You are free to discuss the testimony of the witnesses with your fellow jurors, but each of you must rely upon your own individual memory as to what a witness did or did not say. You should not view your notes as authoritative records or consider them as a transcript of the testimony. Your notes should carry no more weight than the unrecorded recollection of another juror. Expert Witnesses During the trial, you heard the expert testimony of Thomas Walker, who was described to us as an expert in the field of gang investigations, Timothy Shade, who was described to us as an expert in the field of fingerprint examinations, Marlon Newport, who was described to us as an expert in the field of forensic biology, Joel Wade, who was described as an expert in the field of digital forensic analysis. Patricia Razig, who was described as an expert in the field of firearms examinations. James Davis, who was described as an expert in the field of microanalysis. Dr. Eric Nielsen, who was described as an expert in the field of rap music. And Dr. Drinkin Lucent Polchin, who was described as an expert in the field of forensic pathology. The rules of evidence provide that if scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge might assist the jury in understanding the evidence and avoid determining a fact and issue, a witness qualified as an expert by reason of special knowledge, skill, or experience may testify and state his or her, no, that's not her, that's just say his or her opinions concerning such matters and give reasons for his or her testimony. Merely because an expert witness has expressed an opinion does not mean, however, that you are bound to accept this opinion. The same as with any other witness. It is up to you to decide whether you believe this testimony and choose your life on it. Part of that decision will depend on your judgment about whether the witness's background or training and experience is sufficient for the witness to give the expert opinion that you heard. You must also decide whether the witness's opinions were based on sound reasons, judgment, and information. If you were to give the testimony of an expert witness such weight and value as you think it deserves, along with all the other evidence in this case. It is your job to decide what the facts of this case are. You must decide which witnesses you believe and how important you think the testimony is. You do not have to accept or reject everything a witness said. You are free to believe all, none, or part of any person's testimony. In deciding which testimony you believe, you should rely on your own common sense and everyday experience. There is no fixed set of rules for judging whether you believe a witness, but it may help to think about these questions. Was a witness able, or, uh, excuse me, was a witness able to see or hear clearly? How long was a witness watching or listening? Was anything else going on that might have distracted the witness? Did the witness seem to have a good memory? How did the witness look and act while testifying? Did the witness seem to be making an honest effort to tell the truth, or did the witness seem to evade the questions? Has there been any evidence presented regarding the witness's intelligence, respectability, or reputation for truthfulness? Does the witness have any bias, prejudice, or personal interest in how the case is decided? Have there been any promises, threats, suggestions, or other influences that affected how the witness testified? In general, does a witness have any special reason to tell the truth or any special reason to lie? All in all, how reasonable does a witness's testimony seem when you think about all the other evidence in the case? Sometimes the testimony of different witnesses will not agree, and you must decide which testimony you accept. You shouldn't think about whether this agreement involves something important or not, and whether you think someone is lying or is simply mistaken. People see and hear things differently, and witnesses may testify honestly, but simply be wrong about what they thought they saw or remembered. It is also a good idea to think about which testimony agrees best with the other evidence in the case. However, you may conclude that a witness deliberately lied about something that is important to how you decide the case. If so, you may choose not to accept anything that witness said. On the other hand, if you think the witness lied about some things but told the truth about others, you may simply accept the part you think is true and ignore the rest. A witness may be impeached by proving that he or she has made some material statements out of court which are at variance with his or her evidence on the witness stand. However, unless entered as a numbered exhibit by the court and allowed to be taken by you back to the jury room when you deliberate, 
proof of such prior inconsistent statements may be considered by you only for the purpose of testing the witness's credibility and not as substantive evidence of the truth of the matter asserted in such out-of-court statements. Further, a witness may be impeached by a careful cross-examination involving the witness in contradictory, unreasonable, and improbable statements. However, immaterial discrepancies or differences in the statements of witnesses not, do not affect their credibility unless it should plainly appear that some witness has willfully testified falsely. When a witness is thus impeached, the jury has a right to disregard his or her evidence and treat it as untrue, except where it is corroborated by other credible testimony or by the facts and circumstances proved in the trial. The defendants have not taken the stand to testify as witnesses, but you shall place no significance on this fact. The defendants are presumed innocent, and the burden is on the state to prove their guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. They are not required to take the stand in their own behalf, and their election not to do so cannot be considered for any purpose against them, nor can any inference be drawn from such fact. Almost done, folks. The guilt of the defendants, as well as any fact required to be proved, may be established by direct evidence, <coughs> by circumstantial evidence, or by both combined. Direct evidence is defined as evidence which proves existence the existence of the fact and issue without inference or presumption. Direct evidence may consist of testimony of a person who has perceived by the means of his or her senses the existence of a fact sought to be proved or disproved. Circumstantial evidence consists of proof of collateral facts and circumstances which do not directly prove the fact and issue, but from which that fact may be logically inferred. It is your duty to decide how much weight to give the direct and circumstantial evidence. The law makes no distinction between the weight that you should give to either one, or say that one is any better evidence than the other. You should consider all the evidence, both direct and circumstantial, and give it whatever weight you believe it deserves. Thus, the important thing for you to keep in mind is whether a piece of evidence is convincing beyond a reasonable doubt, and not whether it's direct or circumstantial. The verdict must represent the considered judgment of each juror, and each juror must agree thereto. <clears throat> the verdict must be unanimous. It is your duty as jurors to consult with one another and to deliberate with a view to reach an agreement if you can do so without violence to your own individual judgment. Each of you must decide the case for yourself, but do so only after impartial consideration of the evidence with your fellow jurors. In the course of your deliberations, do not hesitate to re-examine your own views and change your opinion if convinced it is erroneous. But do not surrender your honest conviction as the way or effect of the evidence solely because of the opinion of your fellow jurors or for the mere purpose of returning a verdict. <laughs> you can have no prejudice or sympathy or allow anything but the law and the evidence to have any influence upon your verdict. You must render your verdict with absolute fairness and impartiality as you think justice and truth dictate. If you find the state has proven a defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, then you should find him guilty. On the other hand, if you find the state has not proven beyond a reasonable doubt a defendant's guilt, or if you have a reasonable doubt as to his guilt, then you must find him <coughs> not guilty. When you retire to the jury room, you will first select one of your members as foreperson who will preside over your deliberations. You will, will be provided with forms for all possible verdicts in this case. The jury will complete the verdict forms, and your foreperson will sign the verdict forms. When you have reached a verdict, you will return to this courtroom, and your foreperson will deliver it to the court. So those are the instructions. At the end of the booklet, you will find a verdict form. There is uh, one for each count uh, against each defendant. I'm going to show these to you real quickly. This is the uh, first one in regards to Mr. Bass. It says, uh, he's got his name at the top. It says, first count with the jury. Find the defendant, should say defendant there. I'm sorry, that's a misprint. Find the defendant, Christopher Bass. And then you'll search the appropriate one. If you find the state is proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of unlawful possession of a weapon, again, the first count alleges prior drug conviction, then you would circle the letter A. And then if you wish to set a fine, you look at the chart, figure out what the possible options are, and you write it in there. The four person would sign it. And then you would date it on the date that you reached that verdict. And the second count looks similar, except instead of, it's a little bit different, instead of saying prior <coughs> conviction, it says prior felony conviction. Now, the third one, again, Mr. Bassett's are all first. Um, they're in order uh, in which they're listed here. Uh, the third count says, We, the jury, find the defendant, Christopher Bassett, and then the charge offense is uh, first degree murder of Xavier Dobson. If you find beyond a reasonable doubt that uh, the state has proven that, you would circle A. Uh, then sign it and date it. You'll see no fine line because there's no fine for first degree murder. If you unanimously find him not guilty of that, then you uh, begin considering the less included offenses, which are listed in the instructions as well as here on the verdict forms in order from greatest to least. And you just work the way down to you have a unanimous verdict. Um, and then not guilty is uh, letter K there. And again, four person would sign it and date it. The fourth count 
uh, is the uh, first of the attempted first degree murder, and you'll see it says uh, Zach Dobson. So that's the alleged victim in the fourth count, and then you uh, mark your finding there, which the first finding you would. And uh, so the other attempted first degree murders all look the same, except it's got the different uh, alleged victim uh, listed on the first form. So I want to show you one other set of instructions concerning <coughs> the employing a farmer in the commission of dangerous felony, because it looks a little bit different. So we'll go to the first one here, I have to do Mr. Bassett. See, it's in small writing, I apologize for that, it's just so we can get it on one page. So this is the first one, it's the fifth count. Uh, this has to be Mr. Bassett's, but they all look the same. They just have different defense names. It says, we the jury find it, the, again, it should, should say, uh, should just say defendant, it says defendant, so that's a typo, folks, please ignore that. We find the defendant, Christopher Bassett, and then you'll circle the appropriate one. The charge of defense is guilty of employing fire under a dangerous felony. The first one is uh, the attempt first degree murder of Zach Dobson, that's the way it's charged. If you find him guilty of that, you would circle the letter A. You must go further and circle the letter of the, um, the dangerous felony that you unanimously find him guilty of. So the charge offense is attempted first degree murder of Zach Dobson. So if you find that beyond a reasonable doubt, then your letters would be capital A and then little a circle. However, if the underlying charge of attempted first degree murder of Zach Dobson, you find him not guilty of that, but you do find him guilty of one of these two lessers, attempted second degree murder or attempted voluntary manslaughter of Zach Dobson, you can still consider this offense, and you would, uh, if you find him unanimously guilty of attempted second degree murder, then it would be the large letter A circle and then little b. All right. So if you find the state is not proven him guilty of employing a farmer in the commission of dangerous felony of uh, attempted first degree murder, attempted second degree murder, or attempted voluntary manslaughter of Zach Dobson, then you go on to consider the next lesser included offense, which is, which is facilitation of employing a farmer in uh, a dangerous felony, happen to be the attempted first degree murder of Zach Dobson. Again, if you find him guilty of that, you circle a capital letter B, but you also have to go further and circle which underlying dangerous felony you believe the state's proven beyond a reasonable doubt, A, B, or C. And then you just work your way down all the way through these until you have a unanimous verdict. And so I think all the others look the same, it's just you know, different alleged victims. So we can have the lights on now. So folks, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send these instructions back with you. They're in this book, but this is the original. Uh, so this is the one that you can't uh, write on on this other than the verdict forms. And the four person will be the one uh, that will sign the verdict forms. The verdict forms with the back of the instructions. We've also made six copies of these instructions for you. If you want additional copies, let us know. We can make as many that if each one of you wants, wants an additional copy, we can. Uh, but we went ahead and made six, thought it would be easier for you uh, there. Uh, so it is now time to get deliberations of Ms. King and Ms. Lehmans. At this point, these other 12 jurors are still valid jurors. It is now 543. There's a good chance we won't even begin deliberations until tomorrow. There's certainly a good chance if we start tonight, we won't have a verdict. So even though I'm going to release you from the building, I am not releasing you from this uh, jury. Because if I were to lose a juror during the course of deliberations, I can bring you back in and re restart the deliberations instead of having to restart this whole trial at other time. So I'm going to send you home with the same instructions I'm sending you home with every other day, and that is do not talk to anybody about this case. Continue to avoid uh, any media about this case. Don't talk to anyone about it. Don't try to learn about it and, uh, outside of this courtroom in any other manner. Uh, I'm going to ask that you would give Officer Coker a phone number where we can reach you. Once we have a verdict, we will then call you and release you. At that point, you will be free to read whatever you want to about the case or talk to anybody you want to. Uh, we are going to maintain your notebooks until we have a unanimous verdict. Once we have that, your notes will be collected and they'll be shredded. Nobody will ever look at those. I've also prepared a certificate of appreciation. Thank you for your service. I'm going to ask Officer Coker to hand each of you these. At this time, uh, you two are free to go. Thank you so much, folks. If I don't see you again, I appreciate your service. Now, the rest of you, uh, we're going to gather all these exhibits together. Uh, it's going to take us a while to do that. So what I want you to do, I want you to go back to the jury room and make two decisions. The first one is, who is going to be your foreperson? The next decision I want you to make is, do you want to begin your deliberations tonight or come back tomorrow? At this point, relatively speaking, you're in, in control of how long we're here. If you want to start tonight and see how far you get, that's okay. If you want to come back tomorrow and start deliberations then, that's fine too. At some point in the evening, I'm going to cut you off and tell you you have to come back tomorrow, okay? So y'all talk among yourselves, see if you want to start tonight, uh, and then I want you to open the door, tell the officers who the four person is, and if you're going to begin your deliberations tonight or start tomorrow. If you're going to begin deliberations tonight, then we will get all those exhibits in to you as soon as we possibly can. If you choose to start deliberations tomorrow, we're not going to send all the exhibits back to you. We're just going to keep them locked up tonight. And then I'll have you come back tomorrow morning. 
I, if, you, if that is your decision, I'm going to have you come back in the courtroom and give you some additional instructions, okay? But at this time, you may take your notebooks, go with the officers, and begin the deliberation. <laughs> Any issues from the state? No. Any issues from the No, you're Ms. Lee, Ms. Rogers? Your Honor, the only, wow. the only issue I have is that I have a federal hearing at 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock tomorrow. Can I just have someone else leave? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Don't go anywhere, anywhere, folks. I mean, you can step out the hall. But they don't know so far. Uh, I need to hear what they're going to say. If uh, if they want to start tonight, I'll just have an officer come out and tell you uh, that they want to start tonight. If they want to come back tomorrow, we're going to bring everybody back in. And I'm going to instruct them. And all right, four stands three sets for Good job, sir. Mr. Jones? No, Your Honor. All right, I'll see you folks at 9 o'clock. Thank you.